Good afternoon and welcome to the second episode of Stanford Amy's Next Gen Tech Talk. We're so delighted to welcome Drs. Maya Yadam, Gabrielle Bunny, and Rana Kabir as today's guests to talk about their work in AI for emergency medicine, as well as our student moderators, Nidhi and Arav. My name is Joanna Kim, and I'm the Executive Director of the Stanford Center for AI and Medicine and Imaging, also known as the Amy Center. Stanford Amy serves as a hub for interdisciplinary AI research, bringing together experts in medicine, computer science, and other fields to leverage AI in transforming healthcare and health outcomes for everyone, everywhere. The next gen tech talks are geared especially towards high school students. You'll hear from renowned experts as they share their professional journeys and exciting work that's shaping healthcare through innovation. A few quick announcements as we start today. Um, we're currently accepting applications for our summer research internship, as well as, as our summer health AI bootcamp. Applications are due March 31st, and please see the links here for more info and also to apply. Also, our next tech talk will be on April 29th, so please feel free to RSVP right after today's talk. And now I'll pass the Zoom mic to Dr. Ala Youssef, AI researcher at Stanford Amy and co-director of the Amy High School programs. He'll kick off today's tech talk. Ala, take it away. Thank you, Johanna, and welcome everyone. Uh, so just a quick reminder uh, to please um, um, see the etiquette reminders that Michelle has pasted into the chat. So uh, in general, we will welcome your, this session is about your questions. So we uh, we invite you to listen to the speaker, uh, to the panelists uh, by uh, um, this introductions and start pasting your questions. Um, and our facilitators will address your questions to the speakers. Please upvote questions in the Q&A function in the Zoom chat, and the upvoted questions will be asked first, but we will also ask the additional questions. Uh, please reminder to keep the questions about career, questions you are interested about, or career trajectories, or education. Um, and lastly, I would like to introduce Dr. Maya Yadam and Dr. Uh, Rana Kabir, as well as Dr. Gabrielle uh, Bani for being here today. Uh, Dr. Maya, Yadam is, um, is a distinguished physician scientist at Stanford University, and she leads a number of uh, projects and programs, um, all targeted towards addressing health disparities and improving healthcare policy using AI. Dr. G Gabrielle Bunny is an innovative fellow in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Stanford, and Dr. Rana Kabir is, a, is an innovation and design fellow at Stanford uh, Department of Emergency Medicine and also pursuing um, an MBA at Berkeley Haas School of Business. We are also excited to have this talk be moderated by two of our uh, summer program graduates um, who really have shined through. Uh, I am pl I'm pleased to introduce Arv, um, Arv uh, Wattel, who was our first year uh, summer program uh, graduate, and he is now a, a first year CS uh, undergraduate student at Stanford University, as well as Nidhi, who is as an inspiring uh, junior high schooler who has really excelled in giving talks in the Bay Area and really spreading education about AI and ML. So with that, I welcome them uh, to the stage and look forward to your questions and to the speakers. Hi everyone, my name is Arv Batal. I'm a freshman student here at Stanford studying computer science and electrical engineering. Um, in high school, I, I took part in Amy's first summer internship program where my team and I actually created um, sorry about that. My team and I created an AI pipeline to identify and box various tubes in chest x-rays. And um, currently, I'm pursuing medical technology development, and I'm creating a robot arm to assist the elderly and disabled. Hi, my name is Nidhi Parthasarathy. I'm a high schooler at Limbrook High School from San Jose, California, and I'm really interested in the intersection between AI and health, and I've been working on several projects in this space. I've also had the opportunity to research more into this area through Stanford AIMI's year, first year long internship last year. And today I'm really excited to learn more about AI in emergency medicine from our distinguished speakers. And I'll pass the mic over to Aram now to start introducing our speakers. Yes, so our first speaker is Dr. Yadam, who is an associate professor of emergency medicine here at Stanford and a researcher with expertise in emergency care clinical operations and timely emergency care delivery. Her work involves refining clinical processes and using informatics to support evidence-based practice, and her interest in population health via emergency care have extended to Haiti, Guyana, and Ghana. 
Dr. Kabir is a clinical instructor of emergency medicine here at Stanford. After graduating with honors at the University of Michigan Medical School and finishing his residency last year at Stanford University, he currently practices emergency medicine at Stanford Healthcare. And finally, Dr. Bunny is an innovation fellow in the Department of Emergency Medicine here at Stanford, and she's passionate about using AI to support emergency medicine care delivery and efficiency. And she has a background in both business and research that allow her to focus on implementing AI technologies into practice. So without further ado, we'll hand it off to our speakers. Hi there, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. It's really our pleasure if I can speak on behalf of my colleagues who are with me today. Um, we thought we'd lead off by giving you a little bit of an overview for what we do that brings us all together in the context of AI. Of AI. And it, AI is a really big term that covers a lot of different things. And there are many different physicians who are involved in artificial intelligence and machine learning and predictive analytics and thoughtful use of existing data and collection of helpful data to help use data to drive healthcare. So we thought we'd share our approach and I think that will give you a little context for how to get the most out of interacting with us today. Now, each of us has a different story for how we got to where we are today. Many of us did not wake up and decide to go off to college thinking about artificial intelligence, but nonetheless, that's where we sit and stand. And we're excited to see so many of you who are interested in how to delve into artificial intelligence as part of your exploration into academics, your career, and how to make this world different, and I'm hoping better. Um, by being part of the movement and the activity that is making the computing and also the practice around artificial intelligence real. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and maybe hop in to just share a few slides and then I'll hand off to Drs. Bunny and Kabir. So first, uh, as was mentioned, I'm an emergency physician. Um, I uh, ended up doing my initial training in college in public policy, um, really studying healthcare policy differences between developed and developing countries and was very interested in how the culture of different countries and their history led to how policies about the same things in different countries actually came were completely different. And what they enabled in terms of the practice of medicine and public health was often quite different, even though, and in each place it might've seemed to make perfect sense, but was the opposite of what was happening in other places and how history really affected policy. And that really relates to some of AI and the biases that we can see in some of the models that we work with. And a lot of that same work seems to apply for the work that I do now. Um, took that work into industry, really learning more about Medicare and Medicaid and the financing. Worked as a management consultant where I had the chance to look at healthcare from the business side and then went to medical school after that. Uh, in med school, I did a master's of public health. Um, trained in a program of emergency medicine in Boston, where I had the opportunity to see the practice of medicine using the same literature in two different places, really looking different at the end of the day, leading to, again, different policies, and really thought, wouldn't it be great to calculate much more precisely what the right thing to do for each patient was? And that's really led to a lot of the research that I do now. So most of what I do really starts from what the patient needs and how they experience healthcare and approach us looking for something, needing for something, focusing on diseases where we all pretty much agree we should be treating it the same way, studying how we don't always end up treating everybody the same way. And a lot of the work that my team is doing and that we're really pursuing and what our colleagues do is this pursuit of algorithmic equity. How do we use um, algorithms to calculate the way we should ideally calculate as humans, but really can't because of space, time, data, and calculation limitations? and use that to our advantage to help us do what we already are trying to do um, to the best of our ability even better. So um, I will share my screen um, with you all and start off with our first slide here, which titles uh, this talk, which is about augmenting human performance um, and in the emergency department and really this idea of automating early EKGs. And so uh, for those of you who have been in an emergency department, you might've had some experiences with this, but Generally, you get seen, you get registered, you might see a nurse who may ask you some questions, and then eventually you see your doctor who's able to come up with your care plan, and generally in that order. However, as things have become more complicated, we've realized that for some diseases, especially things like heart attacks, which is what we diagnose with an EKG or ECG, uh, we need to get it so much earlier than that pathway permits. And so what we try to do is have some criteria when you first check in to see if we can identify people who need to get an early EKG. Well, 
the people who you check in with are not clinicians, they're not doctors, but they need to help make that decision for you. And often the ways we've done it in the past has been very, very simple. But what we've learned through the study of patterns of disease and how people experience healthcare is that the way they present is far more complicated. And so how do you get people who are not uh, in a position to calculate and make medical decisions to calculate the way the patients need them to. And so we felt like this was a situation that was really ripe for an AI algorithm to use existing data that's available at that time to make a stronger calculation than we should expect our staff, our registration staff, uh, our clerical staff who are arriving patients in the ED to expect them to do. And so we um, have been embarking on this process of automating um, how to identify the right patient for early ECGs with AI to better capture the worst kind of heart attack you can have, which is called a STEMI. So we'll talk about that a little bit here. And so one of the things I wanted to bring up front is this idea of our approach is less about taking big data sets and calculating using all possible data available to make precise decisions that are near perfect. We have taken what I like to call a functional approach. It's all about the function that's needed to be performed and using the tools that are available at the point where this function needs to be performed and using that to develop AI that can get the job done better. So our threshold for better has been better than humans. Uh, and so not perfect, but better than humans. And so a lot of what we do is to manipulate the available data mathematically to make more precise decisions, not best. We love to get to best, and I'll talk to that in a moment. But our threshold is really to make it more than what we're currently doing as humans trying to do our best work. And so with this, our definition of AI is much simpler than many people approach it but very much an on the ground perspective for what's needed in medicine as a starting point that can actually help AI touch patients' lives for one of the most dangerous and deadly diseases that exist. Uh, and these are heart attacks, particularly again, a STEMI, the worst kind you can have. So our framework for the use of AI in emergency medicine is the use of computer systems to perform tasks that normally require human thinking, act, uh, calculate human th thinking, sorry there, um, calculation and action. So this really involves four steps. And a lot of the work we've done is to break down what a human does when they're trying to determine if somebody needs to get a test for a heart attack and then teach a computing system to do the same thing by breaking it into phases of activity. So we really modeled what we've evolved and done in medicine, which I'll share with you, and have then asked a computer to do the same. And so our first step here is to understand the decision. Do we know exactly what decision we're making? How clear is it to us? Are we all doing a further way to run? And that is really the space where evidence-based medicine has stepped into. This is the idea of doing research to figure out what are the rules that we should all be following to diagnose people the same way so everybody has a fair shot. And so really the idea here for the logic model um, is the fact that you have a method of how you feel like you should be making this calculation and you have you know the data that's needed to make the calculation and you know the data that you have and that these are the decision rules or clinical pathways. What are the steps for how this integrates with the workflow for what we're trying to do for the patient and how we make the decision in the moment? And then once you understand those two things, you can then program a computer that can use that data and your decision making as the uh, to make a decision using that logic model. And that's really where decision rules and calculators have come in. Where we've seen the next frontier, and this is for diagnostic, where you're trying to figure out what people have. You're trying to find the right people for the right care and to get them the right treatment. And in particular, in our space, where it is a time-sensitive condition. So if you wait until you have more information, you may no longer be able to provide the interventions and treatments and surgeries and medicines that could make the disease go away. And so really we found that these three steps then followed by the fourth phase, which is which is the new, what is the new frontier? The idea of understanding this all so well that you can program it and let a computing system then initiate the action. So letting go of humans being the ones to do this, having trust that you can create a system that does it better than you, and then really being able to have um, a sense of reliability that it can do this continuously and regularly for the patients that we care for. And that really is the next frontier of medicine that we're looking to push and pursue with some of the research that we're doing. And so again, we have this functional approach to AI development, applied AI models that can, these can take years of development for each of these steps that I share with you here. 
and Dr. Bunny can speak to this in just a moment, uh, as well as Dr. Kabir, who's working with a collaborating group in Germany to be able to play out the same, the same steps of this methodology in another environment in another country with different sets of patients to see if this holds true. We call that process validation. And through all that work, we eventually can see if this is something that can be applied effectively, safe and equitably to patients around the world. And so just to give you a little bit of sense for heart attacks and why this makes us so nervous and it's ripe for AI, 26 million people in the United States receive acute coronary syndrome, and that's sort of the spectrum of heart attacks, receive evaluations for this in emergency departments. Of emergency department patients, only 0.4% have heart attacks or acute coronary syndrome, and about 0.1% of those have the worst kind, a STEMI. STEMI is super time sensitive, as we mentioned. The intervention is not effective outside of very narrow time frames. And when I say narrow, as in 90 minutes. So we've got to get a diagnosis in the patient to treatment with our specialist colleagues in 90 minutes. That's really tough to do. You can often wait in an emergency department for 90 minutes. There's a lot of screaming for an infrequent diagnosis. So we're willing to have lots of negative testing just to find those few patients. So how do we use algorithms to make it so we don't test as much, but catch everybody really well? That is the idea of really getting precise because it's like finding a needle in a haystack and we don't know much about people in 10 minutes. So it's, right now our processes are really manual. People kind of get a list of two or three rules for what to do. We're really trying to make it much more complex than that. And at the end, as I mentioned, we really want to do this so that the way that we screen is effective and it's timely and it's also fair. So everybody's getting screened very well. Um, and so what does this pathway look like? It looks like what's here in front of you. The black box on the left-hand side is where the patient arrives in our emergency department or any emergency department. Uh, what's known is what the registration clerk collects for them. We know what that is. The decision is that we need to decide if they are going to have acute coronary syndrome or are they having, are they having it right now? Because if they are, we think they might be, you want to test those people. And then we have to make a decision for yes versus no. If we think they're having a heart attack and we want them to get an early ECG to check and see, if we don't think they're having a heart attack, they can then wait for physician evaluation, which could be several hours. And if their early ECG is done and they're having a heart attack, they'll be taken to a physician who will come and see the patient right away. They'll decide if it's a heart attack. So we're now in that box with the red line around it and they'll move on to treatment. But you can see that if you're having a heart attack, you don't want to end up in this box down here. Now, a lot of the work we're doing is in this box here, how to determine much more precisely who's yes and who's no, trying to minimize the number of people who have actual heart attacks that end up in the no box. So again, that precision game. And these are some of the steps that we're taking to get there. Again, the, the model act the same way when it's in the hospital system as it did when in our computing systems. Is it fast enough for this? Um, is it faster than humans, the manual process? And does it validate when we put it in different environments and not just in other places, but when we look at people of different backgrounds in one place, does it do the same job for everyone, which is a huge piece of the work that we're doing right now. Um, so with that, I will stop and um, perhaps turn off to my colleague, Dr. Bunny and Dr. Kabir, and they can also tell you a lot about how they ended up in this AI space as well. Hi, everyone. Um, it's so wonderful um, to see so many folks here. Um, and thank you so much for having me. Um, and so I think uh, Dr. Yudam really provided a great baseline for what a lot of our work is um, and how we really are approaching and thinking about AI and emergency medicine. But to explain a little bit about how I got uh, into AI and emergency medicine, I will say it is a very circuitous route. Um, and if there's one thing to really think about and take away is that there are a lot of ways to end up you know, in whatever field that you really want to be in. Um, so I actually started off in college knowing that I had an interest in healthcare um, and doing, you know, diligently taking all my pre-med classes, but really wanted to also explore what else was there in, in you know, in, in within healthcare. And so I ended up actually getting a major in economics, um, which is where I really started my interest within kind of understanding healthcare as a business and how it really impacts the rest of the U.S. economy. Um, from there, I went um, to medical school, fell in love with emergency medicine, um, as is very easy to do. Um, and then I went ahead and I did my emergency medicine training um, in Chicago. Um, and during that time, I continued to find my interest um, in business and got my MBA with a focus in finance um, while as a resident. Um, and it was at this stage where I went into my residency thinking, 
you know, in emergency medicine, you know, we see anything, we see everything. And there's so many different directions you can really go in becoming an expert within emergency medicine. So I wasn't quite sure where I was going to, where I was going to land in emergency medicine until one lunchtime talk I went to. And I just so happened to go to a lunchtime talk. And one of my co-residents, a senior resident was talking about some of his work and exploring this new world of AI and healthcare. And I was immediately hooked. And from that day on, I was looking for any and all opportunities to try and figure out, A, learn more about this technology, and B, really, what does it mean to have AI in healthcare? Um, and so with that, that journey brought me here to Stanford um, and into Dr. Yadam's lab um, after a nice cold email saying, I would love to work with you, and I absolutely adore the work that you're doing. Um, and so I started working in her lab as a senior resident and have continued since then. And I'm now the Innovation and Design Fellow, um, the second year fellow with um, Ronald uh, also being a fellow with me. And during this fellowship is really where I started to hone in my interest within AI and healthcare. So innovation and healthcare obviously has a really big meaning. Um, it can be anything from devices to AI to, you know, new care delivery models to innovative ways we can do education. And so within innovation and healthcare, my focus has been on AI and specifically the translation of models from desktop to bedside. So knowing that models can work great within our computers, but how do we actually bring them to the patient and recognizing that the models themselves are almost not always the hardest piece, right? You, you have these mathematical models, they can make predictions on lots of different data, but then how do we actually use them? Um, how do we get them into our workflows? How do we build trust amongst the providers who are trying to use those models and the patients who are receiving care as a result of those models? And so that's been a large area of my focus within uh, my fellowship. Um, in my fellowship, I'm also getting a master's in biomedical data sciences here at Stanford to start to develop. Um, and I see a lot of questions coming in about the coding skills um, and trying to get build, build that baseline um, as I continue to work within this space. Um, alongside of that, I also do a lot working with businesses, so specifically in startups um, and trying to build in academic industry collaborations, really seeing how we can develop technologies, not only in academia, but outside of it and trying to foster the things that are going to best help our patients. And so that's a little bit of, of my background. And like I said, you know, happy, happy to answer any questions about my journey or, you know, what the educational pathway really looks like or what it means to take things from desktop to bedside. Um, but along those lines, I'll go ahead and turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Kabir. Uh, thanks, Gabriel, and thanks, Mayan. Thank you to everybody that's it allowed us to join you and speak and, and learn from you and, and take a moment out of our day to, to, to you know, to share you all. Um, uh, so I'm Rana Kabir. I'm currently serving as the Junior Innovation and Design Fellow uh, through Stanford at the Department of Emergency Medicine. Um, for those of you that don't know what a fellow is, like what a fellow doctor is, don't worry. I have no idea what one was when I was in high school uh, either. And um, basically it gives me the opportunity to further specialize um, and learn more about methods to improve patient care and delivery in healthcare and medicine. And Stanford is unique in that they have a program that's built around the themes of innovation and design. Um, in particular, you know, my focus is uh, within our Department of Emergency Medicine and, and shared work and collaboration that you've already heard from Dr. Uh, Idan and Bunny about. Um, from my background, I'm from Michigan originally, and, and you know, truly, I had no idea what I wanted to do when I wanted to, you know, when I wanted to go to medicine, into medicine. I thought, you know, maybe I'd go into directing or film or, or something else. But um, my parents got sick when I was young, and I'm, I, you know, was very interested in seeing if there was ways that I could help them and learn more about their disease process and. I majored in human biology because I found it, you know, extremely interesting. Um, and after college, I was really motivated to think about population-based health and ways to impact a lot of people, especially um, the, the time after I graduated was um, the Affordable Care Act had passed and millions of people suddenly had access to health care. And I wanted to learn more about health care, health care delivery, and statistics, and studying disease and analyzing it, this entire package of, of knowledge that I didn't already, you know, know how to approach. And... So I found that um, a degree in public health let me do that. And I um, studied epidemiology uh, at um, in Michigan as well. And after receiving that degree, and that was in international health, I loved working internationally. Um, but then I recognized there were a lot of healthcare problems more locally in Michigan. And I got more involved working for my state health department. 
Um, and that was really great. And then I pivoted back and I was like, well, I really like helping people on the big stage, but I also like helping people individually. And I thought to myself, well, why don't I, you know, see if I can apply and get into medical school. Um, and I, I did and, and ultimately pursued emergency medicine because I love so many things about it. You got to help anyone that walks through the door of the hospital, no matter their, their race, their sex, their age, their gender, their economic status, their language, their healthcare literacy, didn't matter. It, it seemed for me like the ultimate combination of so many of my interests in my life so far. Um, one day on a, on a shift when I was a resident um, physician, I met Maya uh, and you know, shout out to Gabrielle to the cold call uh, to <laughs> cold email. It kind of warms my heart that it, and it says a lot about Maya that she does such important, huge work and, and is such a leader in the field. And she's just like, oh, hey, you're interested? Sure, uh, join, join our team. Um, and she shared our, her research interests uh, that she shared with you all. Uh, and I was captivated and I, and I said, what, you know, aha, this is, this is brilliant. Uh, I need to get involved with this work. This kind of combines so many of my interests as well. And I got more in depth and, and you know, regarding the precision of medical care, identification, treatment, and particularly of those with heart attacks. And, and for me, one of the most exciting parts um, is what Maya was describing, which is taking the work that she and, and Gabrielle have done and, and try to validate and, and see if these ideas work in a brand new setting. Um, and uh, Maya touched upon that with uh, taking the work and seeing if it works in, in, in Germany as well. And so much of the, the fun and the interest for me was saying, you know, hey, we have this blueprint. We know this works. We know this works here. Um, we know it works within our system. How do we get it to work somewhere else and see if, see if it does work somewhere else? And if it doesn't, can we find problem points and, and fix them? Um, and that's a new challenge in itself. It's just a continually changing environment. And I, and I just love that. And, and ultimately, it, it kind of um, you know, combines all these things I've already I, I talked about in terms of things I love, like uh, medicine, helping people internationally, helping people locally, helping people um, no, matter, no matter where they are, who they are. And, you know, I, I hope that um, all of you, you know, can think like when you're deciding on how to set aside to, to start working on a problem to solve that, you know, you don't necessarily need to think about the biggest bite that you can take, but even just looking at the, you know, the small things around you, things you can change and approaching and saying, hey, this is a problem. How can I fix this one problem? Thank you very much, um, Dr. Kabir, Dr. Bunny, um, Dr. Yadong. Um, so actually, um, we had... Uh, one question coming in was actually, so Dr. Yadam, you talked a lot about your background in like management consulting and how that led to your career in uh, medicine. And so one of the questions was like, um, like, does the speed of AI, like, um, does the speed of AI results coming out um, really trigger a response from the emergency uh, room personnel or... Yeah, it's a great question. And it's, it's actually uh, one large area of our work. And so, you know, as I, as we were talking about before, with heart attacks, and particularly the uh, STEMIs, which are the worst heart attacks you can have, um, timeliness is everything. Every minute matters. And in medicine, there's a longstanding mantra that time is myocardium or a heart muscle tissue called myocardium. Time is myocardium because every minute that ticks by the heart is that the heart is deprived of oxygen, which is what's happening with a heart attack. Um, it's dying in a way that you can't get back. And if it goes too far, you might lose the very thing that it pumps to support, which is the person. And so every minute matters. And as a result, we've had to build our AI so that it can be faster than humans reliably. It can't miss a day because somebody might die. And the last thing that we need also from um, you know, a quality and a legal perspective is to have somebody missed in the context of an algorithm not running. And so the consistency with which it runs and how quickly it runs in comparison to humans is paramount in our work. And so um, one of the things that we uh, are really excited about is really exploring discovery and development of interventions or things you can do for patients using AI. And we have this really well defined with drugs and medical devices, but it's not as clear with algorithms and mathematics actually moving the system in a way that has to align with certain parameters, like using the registration data to look for heart attacks and doing it in less than five minutes so we can diagnose in 10 minutes and get them to the treatment that they need to be getting in 90 minutes. And so that timeliness factor is key. And so when I was working as a management consultant, 
we were usually looking to save dollars. So we weren't saving myocardium, but it was the same concept. Um, <laughs> usually we were called in when it was pretty emergent. People were hemorrhaging money. So like hemorrhaging blood or not getting blood to heart. So <laughs> similar type of urgency around the scenario. And we were we swooped in like a team to diagnose and assess and create a treatment plan. And then we would often decide if we were the right team to continue with the treatment plan, if it was one of our colleagues, very similar to what we do in emergency medicine. And one of the things I learned in that practice was the concept of patient access and revenue cycle. The idea of taking a patient from the moment that they need something to when they register for care, they get it, they end up recovering, and we end up sort of doing the business side of medicine on the back end. And really looking at healthcare from the patient's view. And that's a lot of how we've done this. And we've seen patients need it to be timely. So a lot of that same urgency and the approach for finding opportunities for AI, opportunities for intervention from the management consulting side to fix things to make the system better is a lot of the same approaches that we've used in the laboratory. But, and timeliness has been a big piece of that. That's actually really interesting that you mentioned the timeliness of AI's applications to healthcare, because um, now kind of following up on that, how much can AI really do? Like, how much can we expect the future of healthcare to rely on this AI? I have many thoughts, but I'll let Dr. Kabir and Dr. Bunny um, chime in on this one, because this is a great one for them. No, I think, so a lot of the applications of AI, you know, I think we talk a lot about AI and the excitement that we have around it. Um, but what we're really, what we have available to us really has to do with the data that we have, right? It's very much about the data and how good the data is, the amount of it, and the easy of accessibility of that data for us to be able to really impact care. And then, so that's kind of how we can really think about what, what are the applications for AI and making sure that it's not just let's put in AI and solve the healthcare problems. It's what is the question you are fundamentally trying to answer? And is AI even the right tool to be able to answer that question? So I think that's one component of thinking about AI and moving in healthcare is really basing it more on the question and recognizing that AI is a tool. And the second component of it is AI really needs to be augmenting human care, human care and the care that we're providing. You know, I think there's a big concern like AI, is, you know, the robots are coming and they're going to take over the world and we're all going to be running for our lives. Um, and I don't really see that actually really being a part of our future. Um, and I feel that way for a couple of reasons. One, um, I mean, as scary as robots are, let's see how really scary you are of like mathematical equations running after you and really thinking about them being able to take over your world. Um, but it's really, but being able to augment human decisions, kind of cognitively offload the care providers is really where AI shines being able to see patterns that we might not be able to see all the time, but also having a sense nonsense check of, they don't really know the patient in front of you, or is this the right care that that particular patient needs at this time? Um, and that humanism of making those decisions and really understanding that the care of a patient isn't just about like, you need this medicine, you need this diagnostic test, but really what is appropriate for what that patient's goals are? What is it that they really need? What is it that their family really needs? I think will always make AI kind of a partner um, for us and not something that is going to be, you know, when we say, what can it do? It's not going to be able to do everything, I don't think. Yeah, so I think I really definitely think it's really important to view AI as a tool and not something that's going to replace healthcare professionals and in general. Um, and I also really thought that what you said about how data is so important is very um, something that's really important in AI. So I see one of the questions was that um, what input data do you usually you usually use for AI in in an emergency room? Does AI like understand gender, age, and how does that like? Um, one question I would have is how does that like incorporate into like diversity and inclusivity and equity in AI? Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a great question, and and truly, what it, you know, it, it's something that we keep um, getting a little bit more. It's the, kind of like pulling a thread and then figuring out where it leads, uh, because ultimately, what you're going into and, and what uh, Gabrielle was saying earlier in terms of the data that we have, you know, you can think about very simple things when patients get uh, into the emergency department. We have basic things like their age, their their um, medical history, their their sex, their uh, you know, very, very basic demographic statistics is what we call what we say. And then figuring out how to um, 
match their their um, demographic variables that we have with the the problems that they're having um, is what's challenging. And then you know you can take this is not even talking about the the future of what we're trying to do as well, which is like looking at all the inputs and all the data that we collect in terms of lab values, in terms of a cardiac monitor that patients wear, their blood pressure measurements. I don't know if anyone has has been into a hospital yet or, or been you know a patient, but there's a lot of measurements that we're taking nonstop. And the question is ultimately, what are we doing with those measurements? Um, because sometimes we react to certain um, measurements and points of time that we happen to notice, but there's always an interesting field of, well, what if we can start predicting when people are going to start getting sick because the measurements and the data that we have um, is trending in a certain direction. And similar to what Gabriel was saying and, and what we've been talking about in terms of AI being a tool that helps augment uh, rather than a complete problem solver, if, if, a, if AI or ML can help us um, you know, realize that we're missing something or we're no it's noticing something before we notice it and, and trigger some, some kind of flag for us as a provider, to me, that's very exciting. And that, that's, that's the way to, to kind of go hand in glove with utilizing um, uh, an algorithm as an example to help patient care, because at the end of the day, that's what matters. It's, it's not money, it's not uh, necessarily timely, timeliness as a factor, but ultimately it's what are we doing to help this person in front of us? Yeah, and I'd say, you know, a lot of what we spend a ton of time thinking about are what are the right inputs? You know, as Rana was saying, you have to know when the decisions are made and when and when you know what the decisions are made, who's making it, and then how they make that decision, and then what data is available. And you can build, depending on the scenario, models that incorporate lots of other data, but if it's not available real time when the patient is sitting in a bed or in a chair in front of you, it's not really helpful. And so we do see that through these two worlds or this computer sciences, data sciences approach, right? I don't mean it's saying this in a pure sense, where people are just saying, I wanna get the best, biggest data to make great predictions. And on the clinical side saying, well, I make predictions based on the things available to me and that computing is not me. And we really sit in the middle saying, we wanna use the way that you calculate to make your decisions. We wanna use the power of data. And we know that big data set is maybe not what you have available to you, but how do we use what is available to you well, better, more efficiently, more consistently? The equity piece is a big one because, you know, if you ask any emergency physician and say, um, do you want to chase all the heart attacks? Like, do you want to miss the fewest heart attacks or do you want to make sure you don't miss, you miss heart attacks the same amongst everyone? A reasonable, I, I mean, yeah, I want to be fair and that's great, but I don't want to miss any heart attacks. So anything I can do to miss the fewest heart attacks. And there's this constant tension between being efficient and chasing the biggest opportunities and being fair. Because what we've seen in our models is that when the models are not fair, it's because the people who had heart attacks, they often had characteristics that weren't like the majority. And so the more that we chase the volume that is like the majority, the more bias we introduce in the model against those patients. And so you have to have seen those patients when you're training your models. So the model needs to weight them differently. So I'll give you a concrete example. In our prototype heart attack model, um, we saw it improve care. Like when we looked at the sensitivity of how well it captured heart attacks, so much better. But then what we did is we sliced it across different groups and said, well, tell us how you do amongst women and men. Tell us about how you do with Hispanics, non-Hispanics. Tell us how you do with, you know, white patients, black patients, Native American Pacific Islander patients. Like we went down the entire list, Asian patients, people of mixed race, like people who don't identify as a particular race. And um, and basically how the data is structured. This is, these are data elements that get entered into the system when you're registered as a patient. Performance was not the same. Now, in general, everybody was better, but some people got a whole lot better and other people just got a little bit better. And in some groups, they actually did worse. And specifically, we saw that in Black patients, the model performed worse. And we figured why. I, I was so mad. I was like, I just made a racist model. <laughs> How are we going to fix this? So we spent a lot of time in our team trying to dissect this. And a lot of it was because patients, Black patients' heart attacks were happening at younger ages. The curve of age was shifted towards the younger ages. And the model weighted age, because most people have, age, have heart attacks when they're older. 
And so if the epidemiology of the disease is different in different groups, and that's not accounted for in your model, you will make the bias worse. And so it's these kinds of nuanced pieces of healthcare. Now, the other thing I'm not even talking about is, you know, we can only look at this in groups that we already collect data on. So if there are variation that we don't collect data on, I said male versus female, what about patients that don't identify as one end of that gender spectrum? Um, we were not able to account for that in our models because the data hasn't been collected like that over time. So these are all things that I think we need to take into effect, into account and study and dissect when we're trying to look at equity too. And just to build off that briefly to say that, you know, where we found, you know, we found this age versus race was not because we dissected through our model. We dissected through our data. And it really came down to look, drilling down to looking at the data, not building new models, not trying multiple different models. I mean, that will come down the line, but really our understanding really came from our data. And then being able to now take that knowledge and build on it even further, we can now do in a much more thoughtful way because we know the data we're working with, we understand what the core is that we're managing to make thoughtful decisions instead of kind of doing the garbage in, garbage out type of philosophy of really using the data to, to our advantage to help inform our better model going forward. Yeah, I definitely think that's so important, like understanding the data and making sure that you know what's going into it. And that's very helpful for preventing these types of bias and issues that um, Dr. Yadam also talked about. And I really like that example that she gave with like cancer. And I, I thought that was a really great way to explain that. Um, so um, what the next question is about um, the patient's reaction. So I remember Dr. Yadam talked a little bit about how what we make, what you guys make is for the patients, is meant for the patients. So one of the questions we had was, have you noticed how patients react to their treatments being assessed by AI and how is this reaction? That's a great question. And I think there are a couple different angles to look at this. You know, I would often say the way that I feel like AI has the greatest value is that nobody actually knows it's actually doing anything for them, that we're so good at doing what we already are setting out to do with the support of AI to do it even better. Um, and it would be my personal goal is for us to, in the future, have smart hospitals where there are always algorithms in the background looking at your data and patterns and trying to find ways to use that data much more thoughtfully in order for you to get the right care at the right time for each patient. Um, and so that's one approach. Most of the time, the AI isn't engaging with the patient directly, but it can. We can often ask patients to complete more information to make diagnoses and treatment plans much more precise. Um, and knowing that it's going to feed an algorithm that's going to help to um, make their care much more targeted to what they need, I think can be really powerful. Um, that's not how we've necessarily used it, but I think there's a lot of potential in healthcare for that to be on the treatment side, a huge part of how we approach this. Yeah, Great. even to, to that, yeah, I, go ahead. I would just add, um, you know, this is maybe me talking about movies again briefly, but it, I think of it almost like CGI. You know, you can always recognize when there's bad CGI, but do you ever, and people comment on it, but do you ever comment on when CGI is so good that you don't even notice it happening in the background? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great example of, um, of how um, AI could be, um, used for like patients. Uh, but um, actually we are running at getting to the end of the um, session. So um, that would be our last question. And um, we just wanted to take a minute to thank everyone for how, um, for this webinar. This was such an informative webinar. Um, we all learned a lot about AI in emergency care. And I think our discussion about um, all the different types of uh, bias and ethics and also like different equity and um, how patients react to things, everything was so informative and really cool to um, learn about. And I'm really sure that um, everyone got a lot out of this. On that note, we wanted to give a huge thank you to all of our speakers for their invaluable insights and guidance. And um, I'll pass it on to Ara to give a little bit more of thank yous. Yeah, so I'm confident that what we learned today will significantly benefit our future careers and provide us with a very unique perspective on AI and healthcare and particularly emergency medicine. So we really also want to thank all of the participants for their time and for asking such thoughtful questions, which really helped keep the webinar educated for everyone. And finally, thank you to Amy for playing this wonderful event and making this all possible.